So welcome back. Uh, last time we had uh, discussed two topics. Mainly one was a comprehensive overview of National Clean Air Program, and which we showed that it rests on three major pillars. One is building on the uh, network and data science and its archival analytics. Second, in, second pillar is capacity building, institution building, how we can create capacity across the board in all stakeholders who are going to contribute to National Clean Air Program, be it State Pollution Control Board, be it institutes of repute, and, and city officials. And third is, how do we create mechanism that can lead to prevention, mitigation, and abatement of pollution. That was National Clean Air Program. And the second module was on uh, sustainability. And there we basically defined the, uh, the basic definition of sustainability and uh, what are the key ingredient goals behind that, what is a holistic approach so that we can achieve sustainable development, what are the sustainable development goals set by United Nations. So, and then how it has evolved over the period of time and what is its current status in the context of convention of parties that were held sometime back in Paris, followed by that in Glasgow. <clears throat> so now let, uh, let me start the two uh, new modules. One is about the, the impacts of air pollution on human health, crop, heritage buildings and climate, followed by air quality, air pollution monitoring technologies. So let me share my slide and, and uh, let me just start. I hope you all can see this properly. So <clears throat> first of the two modules now is First, this is the impacts of air pollution on health, climate, and heritage mm -hmm. building. As you know me, I'm Sachidanand Sachitripathi. I'm professor at IIT Kanpur. So for this particular module, we have the following contents. We'll first talk about air pollution and health, followed by that kind of pollutant effects on Taj Mahal, the heritage buildings, a case study in point is Taj Mahal, what kind of impact it can have on crop and forest, and finally, the linkages between air pollution and uh, climate. So most of us know now that air pollution has become the largest environmental health threat over a period of time. There are innumerable number of studies, and the one very important study that came out in Lancet a couple of years back that lists all most important factors that cause uh, the death. And evolution has emerged in all the environmental category. The largest factor causing the mortality, human mortality. And it can make basically it can exacerbate diseases like asthma, cancer, pulmonary illness, and heart. So you can see all major diseases very much are possible because of that. And you see in this figure, it shows that what is the million in the millions, right? So it goes about 7 million. Now it's almost 8 million premature deaths are happening because of air pollution. Out of that, about 3 million is because of fine particulate matter and there is another 4 million because of the household exposure that different kind of cooking for people use and that causes also some kind of death. This again shows if you can want to break it down then what you see that how evolution causes variety of very significant diseases. So you have basically chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is called also, you know, COPD. And these numbers are given in the bar. Then there are stroke, that is basically heart-related disease. Then you have ischemic heart disease. Then you have all these lung-related and respiratory 
diseases like trisia, bronchus, lung, and then of course, it also is many particulate matter are carcinogens. They cause cancer, so that also causes significant amount of deaths. And then finally, you have also lower respiratory related infections. So altogether, the number comes this much, which is about, now it has gone, the latest figure shows that it has gone even above 1.5 million premature deaths in India. So this figure is for 2016. In fact, the latest figure which shows that it has exceeded now 1.6 million. So what you see that there are different kind of exposure which can cause different type of diseases. For example, you might have a short term, very high level exposure or you have long term, mild exposure and different kind of impact it would have on human body. So what it shows here is basically starting from the nose of a human body and as particulate matter depending on its size. So the very coarse particles can be trapped right there in the upper part of respiratory system and finer particle can make its way down into the lung and once it enters into the lung, it can actually enter into blood stream and then it can finally go into any part of the body, right? So with the blood, then it can also enter into heart and can cause all kinds of heart related diseases and in lung, it will cause, cause a respiratory disease, okay? So there are, as you see, that there can be short term problem, like you, many times we see when we go out in the city, we see eye irritation, nausea, or sometimes we feel difficulty in breathing. And long-term exposures can cause serious problems related to respiratory, nervous systems, or even there are findings that shows that even reproductive systems can also be impacted. And the factors which cause these are basically how high are the concentration level, what is the duration of exposure, that has, have you been exposed for a few hours, few days, few months, or for many, many years. So if you're in a polluted city and you are breathing the same air in and out for 10 to 15 years, some of the long-term effects would start showing up. <clears throat> so now these are, as we know, that the key pollutants which generally now are monitored. Okay, Some of them are also, as we knew, know last time, the criteria pollutant, which are NOx, this has immediate problem and it is related to irritation to skin, eyes and throat and cough. Then you have carbon monoxide. We know that short term damages could be headache, shortness of breath, but long term can cause death. Many times we hear in villages or many other places during winter time, people use some type of <clears throat> a small, uh, a small pot or something where they burn wood or coal and they keep in their house, their room for the heating purpose. And over a period of time, that carbon dioxide, sorry, carbon monoxide emissions exceed the level. And as we know that carbon monoxide is very efficient in replacing oxygen from our blood. It can replace oxygen and can attach to hemoglobin. And when it exceeds certain amount in the body, it can lead to death. Then you have PM 2.5 and PM 10, which has a cumulative potential to damage human body. Many of that we already have discussed. Then you have sulfur dioxide. It also has immediate effect related to lung disorders, shortness of breath, excuse me and then you have volatile organic compounds which can cause a variety of effects like effects on liver on kidney irritation to eyes and irritation to throat skin and nose and then you have ozone ozone is a important pollutant in troposphere remember that in a stratosphere it shields ultraviolet so it's required to be there and because it has started depleting, that's why we have a problem of ozone hole. But that is in stratosphere, something from 20 to 40 kilometer. But close to surface, 
in the first half a kilometer, if your ozone exceeds certain amount, then it is also a pollutant and it can cause again several kind of problems to human body, including eyes itching, burning, respiratory disorders, and many other issues. Now, this is a very interesting work that came out about a couple of years back and was published in Nature. And what is shown here is that what is the total premature deaths globally because of particulate matter itself. And that shows that, you know, these reds, if you see this scale, as you go from green to red, it shows higher number. And what we see here is that good part of India and in that also the Indo-Gangetic Plains and some part of China, where people use some type of solid fuel. The premature deaths are exceeding few hundred thousands or even a million. And on the right, you have similar global map, but these deaths are linked to the particular source of pollution. And what you see that those two red hot spots over India and China are shown in blue here, which is basically a residential cooking related sources. Okay, so basically most of the deaths in this particular work was attributed to the solid fuel which people use in homes in India. But certainly this number would change now because of the proliferation of Ujjala or PMUI. Now more and more people slowly in India have started or have been given the LPG cylinders. So hopefully, if they continue to use it, and if penetration of LPG increases in rural India, then this number definitely will be able to save lives. This is again a work, interesting work, which was done by uh, IIT Delhi group. And that shows that, again, what is the number of death because of indoor emitted particulate matter 2.5. And that again clearly shows that this part of India, right from Northwest provinces, that is Punjab, uh, all the way in the Gangetic Plain and right up to Northeast India are the dominant regions where we have most of the premature deaths that are, that are occurring, okay? Uh, this is a work which we conducted some time back in Delhi. This is a method where you can estimate oxidative potential of particulate matter by using a, some kind of an assay. Oxidative potential, as you see, is a metric that gives you a very accurate idea that how the particulate matter can damage your cells. High oxidative potential for a particular species implies that it can damage more cells in your lung. Right? So in this work, we were able to get the real-time information of the sources of particulate matter. And then we could also measure oxidative potential. So we could clearly attribute that what source will be or is contributing to how much oxidative potential. So in that way, you can categorize or basically list in the order of their damage potential, the sources, and it gives you a very good information or a strong lever that how do you want to, how do you want to prioritize the mitigation or stopping of the sources. <clears throat> then of course, we also know that many times where there are very high amount of particulate matter and particularly if they contain either sulfur dioxide or NOx, which can easily convert into sulfate and nitrate and finally into sulfuric acid and nitric acid, then they can lead to acid rain. That is rain, which generally is almost close to neutral. This pH is close to seven, but if these acidic species 
get dissolved into raindrops, then the nature of rain can, becomes acidic and that can cause damage to monuments and also to the ecosystem because if acidic rain falls on the lake, it can definitely damage the aquatic life. If it falls on heritage buildings, it can lead to damage of the outer surface of heritage buildings. So <clears throat> certainly one important work which uh, we conducted some time back to see how or what are the most important or pertinent causes of discoloration of Taj Mahal. We have seen that over a period of time, this historic monument's outer marble surface has started looking murky or yellowish. But it was not clearly known that what is the reason behind it. So this work, what we did in Agra, in Taj Mahal premises, we collected particulate matter samples and it was analyzed for its chemical composition and its size distribution was also measured. And then using that information, we were able to estimate how the visibility, how the, how the human eyes perceive the color of Taj Mahal. Okay. And that we relate it with several surrogate marble surfaces, which we had put in the Taj Mahal premises. By doing this modeling, we could estimate that <clears throat> what is the amount of particulate matter and which type of particulate matter is causing discoloration of outer surfaces of Taj Mahal. And we could estimate that it's, a, it's basically equally apportioned between carbon and organic carbon and dust. This is a picture which shows the scaffoldings which general, they are generally they put every couple of years to treat the outer surface of Taj Mahal using some kind of mud. Because as I said that it continues to soil and if you don't treat it, then you will lose its natural white and pinkish color of this iconic monument. And then <clears throat> a follow-up of work was done to link the, the organic and black carbon, which was causing discoloration of Taj Mahal, to sources which are operating in and around the Taj Mahal premises. So using a modeling framework, we were able to understand that two sources, for example, the open municipal solid waste burning and also dung cake, different cattle and their dung, people make them cakes, as you know, and they, those cakes are also burned for various purposes. We could clearly apportion that the deposition of these particulate matter over Taj Mahal outer surfaces, <clears throat> which are causing discoloration to a large extent, how they are being contributed by these two major sources. And we found that open municipal solid waste burning is a significant contributor to the deposition which is happening over Taj Mahal surfaces. Then there are now a good body of research which shows that both gases and particulate matter deposition on crop can lead to a variety of damages and eventually it can reduce crop yield in a significant way this can be caused by ground level ozone nox and volatile organic carbon and in some cases it also includes particulate matter through deposition and also by shielding the sunlight. The, the thick haze can shield the sunlight, which is an important requirement for the crop to grow because it is it cause it actually is involved in the photosynthesis process. So here is a work which was a collaborative work done 
using the ISRO GBP network of ozone across India, and then using the crop yield data, the long-term estimates from network of ozone and the crop yield information available from the government records, we could find out that what is the overall loss in wheat crop okay, and in rice crop. And we found that these losses are significant, as you say, that overall pan-India, the loss could be up to 15% of wheat and up to 7% of rice. That is only happening because of the ground level ozone pollution. So you can understand that this is a major loss for an agrarian, uh, primarily an agrarian society like ours in India. And it can also pose some kind of a food security threat. Definitely, it requires that measures should also be taken to basically arrest the kind of damage pollution is causing to crop yield, etc. This is another very interesting work <clears throat> that was done by uh, this uh, these authors, which they looked at the major part of India, which is always uh, have are known as hot pollution hot spot. So what you see that these figure shows the optical depth over India measured by MODIS. And it shows clearly, as you see that the, the Gangetic Plain, which is has a very high optical depth exceeding some point, point 0.8. And these are the regions which are also primarily the wheat and rice growing area. And they, they could actually estimate that because of ozone and particulate matter, the losses could be as high as 25 to 30% in these major states, which is of course huge. <clears throat> now, we also know that that high level of pollution when visibility reduces below certain level, it can cause haze. And then of course it can have severe other issues. And then, then there are other issues like ozone depletion, which is primarily because of some of the refrigerants, the gases which are used in refrigerators or in air conditioning. We know that they are called chloro, chlorocarbon and if and they are highly inert gases. So if they once they are released into atmosphere, they can right go up to the stratosphere and they can cause ozone hole. But that's not really directly related to air pollution. These are more related to the global climate change issues. <clears throat> Finally, we are also trying to understand that how the particulate matter is impacting the climate. It is, of course, impacting the regional climate. Here we have looked at how it is impacting the climate of cities over Gangetic Plain. So what you see here is that <clears throat> Basically, this is the Gangetic Plain. Here is the Kanpur. Here are some rainfall measurements over Kanpur over three stations. You see, these three stations are basically located during summer time in the going from upwind to the downwind direction where IIT Kanpur is. This is IIT Kanpur. And as you go this direction, this is the upwind direction. That is the wind which comes, the south easterly winds, or easterly winds which are coming from Bay of Bengal. And what we have seen that over a period of, substantial period of measurements, we always found that highest amount of rainfall was seen over the urban location. And this was not only seen in the ground-based rainfall gaze measurements, but also this was shown in TRMM, you know, TRMM is a satellite which has been giving rainfall measurements for a very long time. That information we also took and we found a very similar trends. So then we tried to understand why this is happening by doing some modeling experiments. Which kind of model we used was 
Worf model, Worf coupled with chemistry. And interestingly, we looked into two sets of cities, one which are polluted, which are in the north flank of Gangetic Plain, basically Delhi, Durgapur, Kolkata, Kanpur, and Agra. And then ones which are at the peninsula, in the southern flank, which are relatively clean. You see that these are Daman, Surat, Badodara, Indore, Ahmedabad, and Nagpur. And what we are looking at, that how the rainfall is enhanced, what we have seen there in the city, right in the city, compared to the upwind, the peri-urban or rural part of the city. We found that as there is an increase in cloud condensation nuclei. What is cloud condensation nuclei? It is basically part of particulate matter or condensation nuclei on which cloud droplets form. Okay, you know, cloud droplets cannot form in the absence of particulate matter. So these particular specific particulate matter, special particulate matter are called cloud condensation nuclei. And what you see that there's a very clear pattern with increasing cloud condensation nuclei. There is a significant enhancement in rain, which is more in these cities compared to the cleaner cities. So this shows that what kind of impact on climate we are seeing because of these increasing particulate matter. And this is a final work which sometime back we did, where we found that because of enhanced amount of particulate matter, it can, it can modify the shape of cloud. So what you see in this case, when you have low number of particulate matter, the cloud shape and cloud height is different, strikingly different compared to when you have very high amount of particulate matter. You see, the cloud height has increased, it has gone up, and it has also increased in size. And what you also notice that cloud composition also has changed. Compared to low aerosol, low particulate matter cloud, this cloud has a lot more droplets, a lot more ice particles. So its physical properties have also changed. And these are not only based on modeling, these also have been substantiated by satellite measurements. So these two different kinds of clouds in two different environments, one is clean, another is polluted, can have a very different feedback into the regional climate system and to the development and onset of monsoon systems, which is a very important phenomena that brings almost all the rain to the Indian sub subcontinent, okay? So these are some of the references for the part we just covered. Now we'll go into the air quality monitoring network. This is the final module for the first two hours of induction training. <clears throat> so the main contents which we are going to cover here is the ambient monitoring system. What are the criteria pollutants that we have covered already? How do we sample? What kind of instruments you use? How do you select a site? This is called siting of instruments. What is the current status of monitoring? What should be the future outlook to the monitoring? And how can we augment it with alternate technologies like using low cost sensor or satellites? So, why do we do monitoring? We want to understand what's the level of pollution. Then it is also used for regulatory purposes many a times that you want to basically use the information, use the level of PM, use the level of gases which are there in ambient to bring the air quality in safe limit. And then also it provides information in, in your air quality management overall plans. These are the criterion pollutants that already we have discussed during NCAP. So I'm not going to go into that, but remember that there are mainly four 
gases and there are two kind of particulate matter pm 2.5 and pm 10 now there are two different kind of sampling generally which happens as a part of national ambient monitoring in india one is a grab where you try to sample and then bring it to the lab and analyze it let's call manual and the second is of course where you are you have a continuous monitoring going on they are basically part of the continuous ambient air quality monitoring station where instruments are basically measuring in real time you are not a, uh, going to grab and sample it and bring the laboratory and wait so in continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations mainly we use research grade instruments or equivalent research grade instruments so that is somewhat they are basically they can be traced their measurements can be traced to the reference grade instruments which are very precise and have been of course linked to the the fundamental measurements of mass etc done at the us nist laboratory okay so for particulate matter generally they use ebam which is beta attenuation monitor and then of course now there are sensors which are also coming up and we'll discuss that briefly as we go along how do you select sites now it depends on what's the size of the network how many stations you want to operate but primarily speaking we first want to look at the density of people because our main goal is to see what is the pollutant which people are exposed to then we want to keep them away from trees buildings and roads because they can create artifacts in the measurements then we also keep want to keep it a little away from point sources because otherwise it will start sampling the plume directly then it is also important to, to keep it little away from ground okay so that again the important uh, question is that the ground level artifacts should not come in and we also in some way want to see what the people are exposed to so ideally it should be somewhere from probably two meter to four or five meter generally where these uh, sampling probes are placed and then of course there are logistics issues that you should have the power availability ensured and then also telephone or internet should also be availability should be ensured so nowadays there are mainly two kind of stations or monitoring approaches you can say one is which is stationary so you see there is a this station which has housed all the equipments you see sampling probes are kept outside so basically you can see it's about 10 feet which is about a three meter at which it is sampling a second approach which also is becoming very increasingly common and very important to track trace and distinguish between sources is to make such kind of stations mobile this is what you see there's a mobile van which has also housed some of these basic instruments and it also might contain some advanced instrumentation and it is on wheel it is a laboratory on wheel so anywhere you can park and it will start functioning like this lab and it can start doing the measurements <clears throat> so if you look that current uh, network over india it shows that i mean about 200 to 250 stations which are cea qms and about 600 plus are the manual monitoring stations and it shows the green ones are live and then some of them have become inactive here and you can also see that for example delhi ncr has a very dense network likewise mumbai has also a fairly dense network this is what shows in this paper which was kind of a giving a road map for air quality monitoring over india so this shows that what is the current level of monitoring and that shows that this is very sparse monitoring and what is the need the future need of monitoring over india 
that shows that India really requires about, depending on the population density, it requires more than 4,000 only continuous air quality monitoring stations. But we know that each of these stations are very expensive, cost you about 1.5 or 1.6 crore for the procurement and maintenance over a period of four years. And it is all imported. They are not currently developed or integrated or fabricated in the country. So given that, there is a need to optimize the network size so that we still cover based on the requirement of population density without compromising with the data, but in an economic feasible way. And that possibility is there by creating an optimal blending of continuous air quality monitoring stations with sensors-based air quality measurements. So this is what is a framework which is proposed in paper that global estimates can be made by satellite-based observations. Remember, satellites give you some good information, but they do not give you direct measurements of particulate matter. Even in case of gases also, they provide you columnar measurements. So from column to get to the concentration, what you breathe, you need to actually do some additional calculations. So they are basically, you do these estimates two times. So errors are high, particularly in the case of particulate matter, but they are good for long-term measurements. And then of course, from there, one can go to the regional, where we can do the mobile measurements or using continuous air quality monitoring station. And then finally it says at the local level, we can deploy these sensors. That when we say local, that means at a neighborhood scale. That means if you have a city, ideally every ward of the city should have a monitoring of air quality happening. And that is not possible with the continuous air quality monitoring station because each of them are costing about 200,000 US dollars, 1.6 to 1.7 crore. But in that, you can have as much as about 50 to 80 sensors, which you can actually spread across the city covering each and every block or uh, wards. So this is what basically is currently where things are moving, that the sensors are also, sensor technology is getting perfected by doing more research and feeding that back into it, and then try to augment the continuous air quality monitoring stations using these sensor-based approaches. So here is a approach which we worked on as a part of a project uh, funded by Department of Science and Technology, I, uh, Science Technologies ARM IUSSTF, is called SATLAM, where you use a variety of sensors and try to do the evaluate them in the labs and then in the field using a variety of network technologies, cellular, then NB-IoT, that is IoT technologies, different type of Wi-Fi, and then try to get that data in real time to the server. And from server, analytics can be done and the data can be shown in different forms to the citizens at large or the end users. So sensors are cheap, affordable, very easy to maintain, but they require very, very, uh, uh, they need to be understood for their precision and calibration. Because remember that, that BAMs are traced to the reference grade monitor. So the sensor, if they can be traced to BAM, then of course they are good to go. So this is the work what we looked into first time. This is one of the first work done globally where sensors were evaluated against BAM in Duke University at EPA, Environmental Protection Agencies, research office in US and at Kanpur for three different seasons, 
for winter season here in US and for monsoon and post monsoon at Duke. And we found that a linear model can give you a very good correlation between and a good calibration factor between sensors and BAM measured data. And therefore, the arising calibration factors can be applied to the sensor based measurements to get highly accurate results. Okay. This was for the particulate matter. Then a follow up work we did as a part of SATCOM, where we looked into the again the calibration that is again accuracy of NOx and ozone sensors. And in this case, NOx and ozone sensors were placed next to the gas analyzers, which are part of the continuous air quality monitoring stations. So in this case, NOx and ozone analyzers were run, which are very precise, linked to the, again, reference grade measurements. And next to that, these NOx and ozone sensors were placed and in at two locations in Delhi and Mumbai, which are two very different locations. And what you see that, that using advanced machine learning models, one could get a very high level of correlation between the sensors measures, measured gas, that is NOx and ozone concentration, and those measured, measured by reference grade analyzer, gas analyzers. And these all work were done part of Saptam in India. We also looked into PM10. So this is the device we use as a part of Saptam. And this device was placed next to the BAM, but the BAM was run in PM10 mode. You know, BAM has two inlets, one samples PM2.5, another samples PM10. So the first work, what we showed was, we looked into the accuracy of PM2.5 sensors. Here we looked into the accuracy of PM10 sensors. And again, we found that even for PM10, at two different sites, distinct sites, one at Rajendra Nagar and second at Mano Rajna International University. So one is a highly urban city, another is a lesser urban to that extent. We could look into the accuracy of PM10 sensors vis-a-vis -vis the BAM measured PM10. And we found that there is a good agreement between these two. Certainly PM2.5 sensors have a more accuracy and better agreement with PM2.5 measured by BAM, but PM10 are also giving us reasonable accuracy. So for PM2.5, it goes up to, with humidity come correction, it can go up to 0.9, but for PM10, it goes up to 0.75. Now, uh, a follow-up, project for field evaluation at a larger scale was done in Mumbai of PM2.5 sensors. This was done in collaboration with Maharashtra Pollution Control Board and was also supported by one leading philanthropy. There, MPCB has been kind to give us their entire network of 15 monitors in Mumbai. And across that 40 sensors, 40 sensors from four startups, all indigenously integrated were deployed in Mumbai. And these 40 units have three different kinds of sensors, all PM2.5. And we found across 15 sites in two different seasons from November 2020 to May 2021 run across seven months, we found a very good agreement, overall a very good agreement, at least for two kinds of sensors. As far as PM2.5 measurements are concerned, with respect to BAM measured PM2.5. That was the one key outcome. And second, we also could see that 
a calibration model developed at a co-located site can be adopted and be applied to a different site. Because remember that when you are going to apply a dense network in the city, it would be difficult to bring the BAM instruments at every sensor location. So there are two possibilities. Either the sensors are brought to the a BAM site or at some sites where BAMs are co-located with sensors and based on that data set, a model is developed and that model can be then applied to, to the network across, can apply to the all sensors across the network. And there we showed that, that using new machine learning models, this is a very much a achievable uh, thing. And here what we also have done that we have uh, deployed a network of 30 sensors in Delhi. And we look, these sensors are calibrated with a BAM before deployment in Delhi. We decalibrated it at Kanpur. And then we looked into the sensors data in real time in the field compared with the close by government monitor data. This is what is shown here. The blue dots are linearly calibrated value. And this orange are using close by CPCB or DPCC monitors, that's the government BAM measurements, and then doing some their interpolation because they are not exactly at that place where sensors are running. So you do some kind of interpolation to get a value there. And what you see that at two stations, the sensors measure value that is in orange and especially interpolated values measured from government monitors have a very close match with an R square of 0.92 and a mean absolute error of just about 10 or 20 microgram, whereas the average concentration in both these at both these stations are somewhere between 150 to 200 microgram. So this is looking quite promising. So these are the some of the references I used in the monitoring part of my lecture. So thank you for all your attention. And I hope that you had a a good learning experience and I look forward to having a very interactive question and answer session at the end of the today's induction training module. Thank you.